the materialist conception of AI and ethics. Again, this is not very ambitious. I am not, not trying to provide you with a brand new framework. Just trying to suggest a new way of thinking about ethics, which might be useful. Like one question which was not asked in the last one is that if I prefer uh, human rights and regulations as opposed to ethics frameworks, but don't aren't human rights ethical? Are isn't law something that needs to be guided by ethics? And the answer is of course yes, laws are guided by ethical frameworks as well. But the point is ethical frameworks differ. So what should be the basis of your ethical framework is a question that is I think more interesting. And one such thing I am going to propose which is a materialist conception. Now what is a materialist conception? So materialism is a, so I am not talking about materialism in the sense of oh me wanting lot of stuff like as it is used colloquially. That is not, it is a philosophical word. So, in philosophy and I am not a philosopher. So, if anybody is and I get things wrong, forgive me. But materialism basically means that we live in a physical universe that all things that happen in those in that physical universe have a causal effect that things have causes and effect while your observation might be faulty and etc. But things do happen in the real world separate from your observation. Your observation may imperfectly perceive it, but there is still an objective reality that is materialism. And even the things you perceive and whatever is happening in your mind, that is also due to causes and effects. That is also due to some kind of natural reason. So that is materialism. But this sounds very scientific and philosophical. How does it connect with ethics is the question, right? But how are physical processes connected with ethics? So, let us take various phenomena which are connected with ethics. Somebody violates your privacy that is connected with ethics. But why do you mind that somebody violates your privacy? We think really hard about it. Why is privacy violation bad? Why is privacy so important? Privacy is important because a lack of privacy gives a disproportionate power to somebody else over you. That could be an individual, that could be a collection of individuals, that could be some kind of panopticon, that could be a state. How does this power manifest itself? It manifests itself in forcing you to do some behavior, which is a materialist thing. It could be the pressure of wealth, which is a material thing. It, it The way in which that power operates is through the natural realm, right? It is not through magic. Like, when your privacy is violated, it manifests itself in ways which are directly measurable, which are things you can see in the world. Similarly, uh, let us talk about another thing connected to ethics. We talked about inequity, right? Why does inequity happen? Inequity happens as in this context of AI, inequity happens that some AI systems have cornered some intelligence which can be used to. Uh, do some processes much better or have some kind of dominance over other people in society and hence collect a lot of wealth and that leads to inequity, that leads to concentration. Again, something that happens in the material realm. Let us talk about the third thing in which ethics is connected and uh, one of the way ethics is connected is that uh, it could change, it could affect politics. And, and make make you as a society do unethical things where certain uses of AI is concerned. Again, these things like even information, even rumors, etc., are materially connected. Like you have, for example, we used to analyze social media presences and all, but those are connected to physical systems, right? Like the way social media works is not some or like it. Even virality is a physical thing. It happens because some algorithms behind are doing certain things. So, ethics are very much connected with physical processes. Now, are rights connected to material reality? Yes, they are. Every single right you have from the right to life to right of equality. All of these rights translate into the world through material norms. What does right to live mean? It means that you know, you will not, your life will not be in jeopardy. But how would your life be in jeopardy due to some physical forces which a state or an individual or a company does? 
how would your equality be threatened through some again some some actual uh, forces of wealth of other kinds of power which would be leveraged through the physical world so what i'm trying to say is that ethics and rights could be connected in the material realm and it it could becomes it could become a way wherein you observe them in in a very dense form and hence have a model of ethics which actually means to do something in the real world hence it could be a basis of regulations and laws and just thinking about laws from a more this goes the other way as well so laws because they already exist you operate in a reality which already has laws they are already affecting material reality some of those laws can be just some of them could be unjust but by the very existence of those laws your material reality becomes disbalanced your material reality changes regulations often have unintended effects but those effects often show themselves in terms of material reality sort of contracting this whole material reality into the small thing of data socio technical systems and ai how do those materially influence individual and social rights let's talk about individual rights first we have seen that ai systems certain ai systems in certain places can dramatically curtail your individual rights systems which are uh, aiding various kinds of surveillance norms right and by the very presence of those systems your rights as an individual fall into jeopardy you have other ai systems which uh, can be secure under human beings i had mentioned moderation in the last talk moderation of public speech etc now by the very presence of ai systems there you are having you know the responsibility of moderation is being taken away from humans or at least the companies would like to pretend so and hence various social media companies are trying to automate away their moderation protocols faulty as that is the way it ultimately ends up operating is affecting your speech which is a very material thing because you know you can shout in an empty room but ultimately these these platforms are the new public squares maybe right to forgotten maybe sanity right to the getting to right to forgotten um so I, i did mention right to forgotten in the last one but like okay. so right to forgotten operates in various ways what is the most insidious bit is that the information which is being collected about you in various platforms hard guideline guidelines right now to annihilate that information so various ai systems you are a part of them whether you want to be or not often uh, when uh, for example when anonymization is done it's also something that is contested you could de-anonymize data using machine learning uh, similarly uh, you know we would like we have so many places where uh biometric data and facial data is been taken and we don't really have any control over that data now that data does reside in physical artifacts so again annihilating that data is go- could be very much a material action that you take it's, it's something you do in the realm of the real world and and also it connects to ethics now that was socio technical systems all of them operate like this what is a socio technical system we talk of technological systems but i would like you to think of them not as technology but as something which exist within society and technology when we talk of these technological systems none of them operate without the social context as they are in none of them operate without the data they take from society or the intelligence they take from society so the existence of that uh, system is not an interaction between society and technology there is, there is a neologism here called interaction there is this philosopher called bader who had termed it interaction by which he meant that the entity are not two separate things of technology and society interacting between each other it's one entity of that particular use case of technology and that particular use case of society which forms a unique whole 
and outside of that context that equation completely changes. I think we need to start thinking about that when, when we think of socio technical systems and of course, there are social rights the right to right right of self determination for example, one of the most important social rights we have and that right has already been eroded in so many ways right. You cannot determine how you would communicate as a society because you are forced to use certain platforms because they have a complete monopoly over your society. The democratic control of your society has already been pawned off by the state to non-state actors outside your society which have a parasitical relationship with your society using wealth again all very material things and of course, you have that leading to inequity. One very small example I would like to give not an AI example, but a platform example. When uh, Uber came to India, do you remember the prices they were like the rent, the, the salaries they were promising people like 1 lakh a month and something like that and within like a within an year or two, it had shrunk 10 times and like you know, you could say oh show us the algorithm, show us the algorithm and they might show you the algorithm might again. Uh, very hard, but they might, they would never show you the complete data set because that is where the thing is. And ultimately, why should a platform which is essentially expropriating somebody's labor get away with it and not even call you a worker? Because they would say, what would they say? That you are not a worker, they, they are a platform and you are freely associating on that platform. So, these are social rights which are getting pawned off at a very fast rate and we need to, when we think of ethics, we need to think of that as well. Okay, so why a materialist conception? I am going to try to really hard sell this point. First of all, AI development or for that matter, any technological development is impossible to think about without considering the society that forms it and the history that is before it. So, why does an AI system gets made? Because people make it. And why do people make it so? Because there are societal pressures, market pressures, etc, etc, which means something else could have also been made. Which means that uh, sure, you could use facial recognition to sort of identify faces, but you could use the same computer vision technology to identify tumors for cancer research, which would be a much better social use. Which one gets made depends on how that society politically decides which one to make. Of course, the market will force it and all, but again, it is not without context, which means that you know the very tru truism I am going to say that it is not the technology, it is the society. So, do not lose that political control on society, the first point. Second point, AI development is connected fundamentally to capital. Now, there is a small point and a large point I am making here. Small point is of course, you know, AI is connected with other resources, what AI gets made is what gets researched, which one gets researched is the one which one gets funded. True for all of us, it was like when I was an AI researcher, the question as a PhD student what is it, who is, who is going to fund us, what project are we going to work on etc, etc. Now, who funds all these big projects, a lot of them are defense companies, right, DARPA funds, DRDO funds and of course, those usages are not going to benefit your society. Then who are the second tier funders like companies which do really shady stuff like Palantir for example, I do not know how many of you know about them, but they are extremely let us just say they do things alright. So, so we have established that A technology is made in a certain historical context, B it is connected with money, but there was a larger point about capital I was trying to make which was that AI itself is capital. AI systems are capital because they they are essentially means of production which which create better wealth using intelligence obtained from data. Hence, the paraphernalia itself is capital. So AI is con con AI is created because of capital and then AI influences capital. By the way, one of the very fast ways in which it influences capital is finance. Finance is getting extremely automated these days and like stock markets etc, machine learning is being used there. So, there are very deep connections here. Third, any ethical framework or AI cannot be, so from point 1 and 2 it follows that any ethical framework for AI 
cannot be divorced from the phys physical reality of the socio technological environment that is operating in in short if something works in america doesn't mean that same thing would work well in india because you can't take something out of its context you have to understand the whole thing money society culture capital everything and then accordingly make development fourth the current conception of ai as pro property limits the harm reduction one can achieve or the benefits one can obtain for the community which builds it this is the last few words are something i really want you to internalize that ai is built by community always because there is no machine learning system which does not operate on data and data comes from society most of it is unpaid labor remember that like when you are working and creating that data you don't realize you are working right you are on your phone you are clicking away at things you are in your car you are driving away and your phone is recording your location all the time you are creating this valuable intelligence for these companies you are not compensated and i am not suggesting that you know you should propertify it and sell it that's also bad by the way because then only the poor people would be forced to sell because that's the only capital they would have and that would be one further level of injustice so i'm not saying that because that always is an answer oh okay then we will buy it we will buy the personal data but that also has terrible consequences so it should not be propertified in that particular way but if the community generates the data and the algorithms as well in an indirect fashion by by doing the research and most of this research does happen in public universities then i would say that we need to go towards an actual model of commons rather than the sort of developmentalist model of commons we have right now which is i think a misattribution of terms because commons can't just mean that oh we will collect data and we will do development with that commons has to mean that we will collect data because that data was that community is in the first place so that community must control that data the intelligence that is extracted from that data is used for the direct benefit of that community controlled by that community in a democratic fashion that's my line on it and and how do you make that analysis you will have to analyze how ai and society are operating in very materialist terms the value which goes in the value which goes out i am going to tell, i am going to quote this uh, uh, infosys gentleman i know who is a long time uh, person in that company has seen india's it boom pretty much well now works as an academic and he said you know anupam there are no metrics like if you ask somebody how much money over the decades has been poured in the it sector and what value it created not from the stockholder value point of view but like actual benefit to the community actual jobs actual growth the answers might surprise you the answers might as well be that it has been just an engine of further inequity more than anything else and this was a person from the industry so and i have looked and these numbers are not present like we are talking about these grandiose terms like fourth industrial revolution and whatever but where are the hard numbers and why are we so optimistic that this time we will have the job creation etc when all we have had is jobless growth okay now another line because we are talking of ethics so we should talk very basic stuff and this is a problem i have with these discussions usually that everybody talks about ai especially the government and especially these companies fourth industrial revolution right as if ai is something completely different something which came out of i don't know some mystical smog and it will save us all or destroy us all it's not really you know we have had techno like paradigm shift in technological changes before and we have had terrible terrible events after that do you guys remember how the world was like when the steam engine was invented and when capitalism formed because of the steam engine when like the economic relations changed how many revolutions coups military dictatorships riots happened at that time because of those, that inequality well we have to start thinking like that ai is not that different it's yet another technology how is it different it's different in two very specific ways first unlike most technological leaps in the past instead of augmenting your physical capabilities it augments your intelligence capabilities it 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 takes data makes intelligence available for you you can take better decisions with it so it's doing some 
labor for you of a different kind than earlier machines have done for you and because of that labor it does for you or rather the labor it you do because the labor is the, the labor is still being done by humans it just amplifies it that amplified labor leads to a more quote unquote efficient travel of capital let's put it that right so it's just what was before it's just more faster right that's one way in in which ai is a bit different from the technologies we have seen in the past and the second bit is i think which is the more important stuff is that a lot of humans right now are engaged in doing these uh these uh these what are called uh mal employment so there are two words which uh even i am very new to but i am really liking them one is underemployment and one is mal employment neither is unemployment so what the platforms have done is the gig economy where multiple people have to take multiple shitty jobs that is underemployment where you are doing two three jobs just to get by and mal employment is then because of this certain technological thing where you know average engineers are not even needed anymore in this ai world you are stuck doing bad jobs nobody needs you because only the highly qualified ai engineers are needed right you have this army of people who can only be employed at bad paying jobs so so the usual hawa of automation is that the jobs would go but the sense from the industry rather isn't that jobs would go it's that wages would depress wages would depress because the middle jobs the jobs which took skills are the ones which are going to get automated by ai and 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 a depression in wages and overall depression in wages just adds on to jobless growth and further inequality so we need to do something about it and that has to be the core of any any ethical way of looking at society so you know if if you want human dignity like like kant said human dignity is unimpeachable well now you have a challenge to that you always had a challenge to do that since the steam engine but things have just become a bit faster so let's talk a bit about value and work one another error we often make when we think of ai is we think that the ai is doing the work it's not it's humans who are doing the work ai is aggregating the work and making it faster humans still collect the data ai takes that data machine learning takes that data it squeezes it gets intelligence out of it and then runs some stuff with that intelligence you still needed millions of humans to gather that data for you but each of them did a small atomized amount of labor the labor was still done by humans who didn't even realize they were doing the labor right so it's unpaid work essentially so you you are slowly moving towards a, connecting that with the last argument i made which is the depression in wages of middle workers you are reaching this very problematic place in society i hate the word problematic with because it's a weasel word like you should always tell what problematic right but the the point in society where you have an inequality because the middle jobs are under threat but you also have another inequality because work is not recognized as work extraction is not recognized as extraction and that is a problem because it is so highly atomized so we have been talking about this materialist way of looking at ethics let let's talk a bit about surveillance we have actually touched on this that surveillance first of all there are various kind of surveillance which these ai systems enable but the more interesting question is why surveil why do states surveil well the obvious answer is control but why control why do states want to control and then the obvious answer would be to regulate certain behaviors why do they want to do that and at some point you would hit this barrier and a very interesting thing would come out that there is behaviors which have material benefit to a certain owner class which the state really likes because here is the thing about 
surveillance and brutality in general, state brutality in general. While often brutality uh, looks random, especially to the people it happens, it's not it's not random and it's not silly. It's often highly efficient and it has it's a, it, ha, it has its own logic behind it. Even when you have things like uh, you know colonialism or the new forms of colonialism we are seeing, often it's some kind of settler colonialism where land is involved or power is involved or local elections are involved or something in this world. People don't do brutality without reason. They generally benefit from that. And hence, the materialist interrogation of surveillance starts at that point that why does surveillance happen? Why do states surveil? If, if at all the benefits of AI were community owned and if at all data like certain kinds of data was not allowed to you know even exist it was annihilated as soon as it formed by the community then would surveillance even matter that much think about it and would surveillance happen at at that rate like we are often quick to identify surveillance we are often not as quick to identify why it happens and i think that needs to be interrogated now comes the more irritating bit because I've been seeing so I have been basically talking about the ethics part of it and how to look at ethics in a materialist fashion but unfortunately there is this difference between ethics and morality and technology people often confuse that there has been for a while a certain clamor in the AI space of something called moral machines it's a terrible idea the idea is that machines can take moral decisions they cannot by the way we have established in today's talk quite extensively that moral decisions must stay with human actors but there are a bunch of ai scientists who think otherwise and they think that machines should take moral decisions and then one of course fundamental example they give is that automated car is driving in a road there is a puppy there is an old woman which which one should the automated car kill to which of course my answer is why is there an automated car on the road there shouldn't be an automated car on the road that was a human decision now you have taken that human decision that was your human fault but th th there is this whole idea of moral machines i will later go into this in detail uh, i think first of all i don't like the word moral ethics is something much more definable and all morality has this mystical bent to it and i don't know how to even interpret that moral machine the larger argument of moral machines i have a problem that it uh, sort of fundamentally uh, commodifies and dehumanizes people so I I I, would, I don't have truck with that. The uh, sort of shorter argument of moral machines I am more willing to deal with, which is they, what is they called functional moral machines, wherein it's not that the machines are actually taking moral decisions, but where you need to have like patchwork systems to prevent systems from failing down at a very societal level, and they don't have a better phrase for it, so they call it functional moral machines. And even that I think is fundamentally, you know agency escapes from political actors and goes to machines and machines can't by definition have agency and i don't see what is so special about ai and which has not existed with other complicated machines in the past you know a, a an aeroplane is a remarkably sophisticated machine it has thousands of parts it and if it crashes so many people would die and it's so complex but you never say that you know a jumbo jet should have moral agency doesn't right so why should why should ai again like and also you never say that just because it's so complex and so so sophisticated you know you can't really regulate it because it's too hard for regulators to understand it no aeroplanes get regulated every day yes true 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 and that is a that is a sort of i mean at some point, you are going to make those uh, fair enough. Given that point, that 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 is an ethical decision you are making. At, at that point, that uh, but of course, you know, you could say that. I mean, to carry that forward, you could say that accessibility is a fundamental quality of your society, and not just jumbo jet, but everything should be accessible. And that is something that could be like a line you have in how you form your community. Which I think is more useful because then, if you are talking about AI, I think it makes be better sense to have these certain societal lines which get used on AI rather than having these ad hoc situations and trying to make decisions on them. 
but I see where that is coming from. Uh, so, the moral machine debate by the way, it, it got recently pretty popular because uh, and also entered the policy realm because I do not know, uh, MIT had done this experiment moral machine dot net or something at a website and uh, millions of people actually went to that website and so, th they wanted to show that uh, you know in which culture is it more acceptable to kill old women rather than a dog when the automated car is driving and in which culture it is more acceptable to kill a pedestrian rather than a, a you know some other kind of person and it is an interesting ethnographic cultural sort of experiment as far as I am concerned, but like really making algorithms to have uh, cars take decisions on whom they should crash into I think sort of completely avoids the debate of why certain systems should exist in the first place. By the way, to make an analog with the jumbo jet example, like right now we are facing a climate change crisis, soon somebody might have to take a call that aeroplanes should not exist period. So, boy, I took it down to materialism again. Uh, but you know, there is a, there is a sort of a point of order I want to make here that uh, in the policy space, often uh, there is this uh, mystification of AI which plays into this neoliberal framework of looking at it. And th then example I remember is this really hilarious example I have been quoting everywhere, uh, which completely took some words from the AI realm, but made a meaning of it which was completely different. So, I do not know if you guys remember, they were pretty famous. Uh, some researcher at Facebook had made a bunch of uh, machine learning entities and was teaching them how to communicate with each other and when I say communicate I am like literally machines passing signals between each other and because they were they, they were self evolving they developed some protocol of communication which was highly efficient and which was more efficient than whatever the uh, human researchers had given them and then they were communicating. Now, this news goes out it gets printed into a bunch of newspapers I think it started with MIT review which is a terrible science reporting newspaper. And then everybody interpreted it as two AI systems developed some kind of consciousness or something and were talking in an alien language with each other has AI research gone too far. This is a problem right. AI has so many problems we have been discussing that for like two hours, but the problems people and often policy people think AI has is of a completely different nature which are like which has nothing to do with what AI really is, which attributes things to AI which do not even exist, not helped by the fact that you have certain people, certain very rich people whose name I would not take who are making busy making institutes like you know world something ending institute or existential crisis institute or how AI would end us all institute. And there are enough real problems and you know they are sort of having this discussion which has really no real impact on policy. I think here is my argument that to really understand the ethical implications and, and to develop an alternative ethics framework, you first need to understand what AI is and isn't and a certain degree of technological literacy hence becomes a must for policy people. And why does technological literacy become must? You know, you could exhaust your breath all day talking about whether autonomous weaponry should or should not exist. I would say it should not exist of course. Some some people somewhere might say it should exist, but the point is that the technology itself. So, this is a tank, this is a main battle tank, the Abrams tank. Let us see what happens when we run some of the uh, like not right now state of the art, but like two three years back state of the art computer vision systems on them and see what they detect. Uh, that is a boat apparently, that is a cow, that is a flower pot. This is from one of the best uh, computer vision systems University of Oxford had produced. Another one called clarify said this is an abandoned no person broken old vintage outdoors rusty decaying thing, it is none of those. So, I am trying to make the point here that you know computer vision and natural language processing and various kinds of machine learning are still as a technology you know there is so much scope for improvement. So, at a very brass tack level as a policy person you need to be aware of that and when certain bombastic claims are being made you need to have the awareness to say that you know boss machine learning does not work at like that level, you cannot have automated tanks shooting shells at each other. It is a bad idea in general, 
it's an unethical idea also it's terrible for human rights reasons but also it wouldn't work it will lead to terrible losses it wouldn't work and that articulation i think needs to happen also okay so on optimism triumphalism and apolitical development see this optimism a lot of people have economists especially i don't know where it comes from that new jobs would come there is this example that has often been uh, you know given that india still has a lot of its uh, population still doing agri agrarian labor right so where are these fantastic new jobs which were supposed to have come in the last few industrial revolutions we, we still live in a world where we talk of the fourth industrial revolution but a large part of the global south hasn't even reached the first industrial revolution so this whole thing that it will happen let it happen i think is flawed i think there is lacking of rigor in measuring that secondly on ai triumphalism this idea that let's go with it because that is how things should be no why why should certain things be automated why should certain things have ai like uh, often it goes beyond like simple use cases where you have a need and then you are making a solution and often it's like no no we just need ai here is is pe you have ai the company valuation will go up is pe you have blockchain this would happen that sort of thing we are seeing i remember i was in a workshop where somebody was talking about um finding uh, traffic children and they were like all the agencies in india which are investigating traffic children they should all be connected by a blockchain and i was like you know really like do you know what it's a ledger it's a glorified ledger how perhaps it would help by not erasing the records but like what else does a blockchain do so i think there is a degree of triumphalism when it when we talk of ai which which also is and the third one is this a political development this idea by uh, our ai developers that the things we make they don't have political implications i think we have talked enough today to render that idea completely false now this is not the end so unlike the previous time i'm not showing you the ending movie all right i'm going to show you a video it's a video which had gone viral a few years i think four years back uh, it has some good points but it also has some bad points but it's a very popular video and i want you guys to sort of critique it like note down in your pads or whatever that what is wrong in this video it's a very persuasive video so it's like it was very popular when it happened but there are certain parts of it i have an issue with and we'll discuss that once you have seen this video and i want you to see this video because this is an example of a popular discourse on the impact of ai on society see this video before humans need not apply how many of you have seen this video right that you have used to have to hunt or gather to survive but humans are smart really lazy so we made tools to make our work easier from sticks to plows to tractors we've gone from everyone needing to make food to modern agriculture with almost no one needing to make food and yet we still have abundance of course it's not just farming it's everything we've spent the last several thousand years building tools to reduce physical labor of all kinds these are mechanical muscles stronger more reliable and more tireless than human muscles ever could be and that's a good thing replacing human labor with mechanical muscles frees people to specialize and that leaves everyone better off even those still doing physical labor This is how economies grow and standards of living rise. Some people have specialized to be programmers and engineers whose job is to build mechanical minds. Just as mechanical muscles made human labor less in demand, so are mechanical minds making human brain labor less in demand. This is an economic revolution. You may think we've been here before, but we haven't. This time is different. When you think of automation, you probably think of this giant, custom-built, expensive, efficient, but really dumb robots blind to the world and their own work. They were a scary kind of automation, but they haven't taken over the world because they're only cost-effective in narrow situations. But they're the old kind of automation. This is the new kind. Meet Baxter. Unlike these things which require skilled operators and technicians and millions of dollars, Baxter has vision and can learn what you want him to do by watching you do it, and he costs less than the average annual salary of a human worker. Unlike his older brothers, he isn't pre-programmed for one specific job. He can do whatever work is within the reach of his arms. 
Baxter is what might be thought of as a general purpose robot, and general purpose is a big deal. Think computers. They too started out as highly custom and highly expensive, but when cheap-ish general purpose computers appeared, they quickly became vital to everything. A general purpose computer can just as easily calculate change or assign seats on an airplane or play a game or do anything just by swapping its software. And this huge demand for computers of all kinds is what makes them both more powerful and cheaper every year. Baxter today is the computer of the 1980s. He's not the apex, but the beginning. Even if Baxter is slow, his hourly cost is pennies worth of electricity, while his meat-based competition costs minimum wage. A tenth of the speed is still cost-effective when it's a hundredth the price. And while Baxter isn't as smart as some of the other things we will talk about, he's smart enough to take over many low-skilled jobs. And we've already seen how dumber robots than Baxter can replace jobs. In new supermarkets, what used to be 30 humans is now one human overseeing 30 cashier robots. Or take the hundreds of thousands of baristas employed worldwide. There's a barista robot coming for them. Sure, maybe your guy makes the double mocha whatever just perfect and you'd never trust anyone else, but millions of people don't care and just want a decent cup of coffee. Oh, and by the way, this robot is actually a giant network of robots that remembers who you are and how you like your coffee no matter where you are. Pretty convenient. We think of technological change as the fancy new expensive stuff, but the real change comes from last decade stuff getting cheaper and faster. That's what's happening to robots now. And because their mechanical minds are capable of decision-making, they are out-competing humans for jobs in a way no pure mechanical muscle ever could. Imagine a pair of horses in the early 1900s talking about technology. One worries all these new mechanical muscles will make horses unnecessary. The other reminds him that everything so far has made their lives easier. Remember all that farm work? Remember running from coast to coast delivering mail? Remember riding into battle? All terrible. These new city jobs are pretty cushy, and with so many humans in the cities, there will be more jobs for horses than ever. Even if this car thingy takes off, he might say, there will be new jobs for horses we can't imagine. But you, dear viewer from Beyond 2000, know what happened. There are still working horses, but nothing like before. The horse population peaked in 1915. From that point on, it was nothing but down. There isn't a rule of economics that says better technology makes more better jobs for horses. It sounds shockingly dumb to even say that out loud, but swap horses for humans and suddenly people think it sounds about right. As mechanical muscles pushed horses out of the economy, mechanical minds will do the same to humans. Not immediately, not everywhere, but in large enough numbers and soon enough that it's going to be a huge problem if we're not prepared. And we're not prepared. You, like the second horse, may look at the state of technology now and think it can't possibly replace your job, but technology gets better, cheaper, and faster at a rate biology can't match. Just as the car was the beginning of the end for the horse, so now does the car show us the shape of things to come. Self-driving cars aren't the future. They're here, and they work. Self-driving cars have traveled hundreds of thousands of miles up and down the California coast and through cities, all without human intervention. The question is not if they'll replace cars, but how quickly. They don't need to be perfect, they just need to be better than us. Human drivers, by the way, kill 40,000 people a year with cars just in the United States. Given that self-driving cars don't blink, don't text while driving, don't get sleepy or stupid, it's easy to see them being better than humans because they already are. Now, to describe self-driving cars as cars at all is like calling the first cars mechanical horses. Cars in all their forms are so much more than horses that using the name limits your thinking about what they can even do. Let's call self-driving cars what they really are. Autos, the solution to the transport objects from point A to point B problem. Traditional cars happen to be human-sized to transport humans, but tiny autos can work in warehouses and gigantic autos can work in pit mines. Moving stuff around is who knows how many jobs, but the transportation industry in the United States employs about 3 million people. Extrapolating worldwide, that's something like 70 million jobs at a minimum. These jobs are over. The usual argument is that the unions will prevent it, but history is filled with workers who fought technology that would replace them, and the workers always lose. Economics always wins, and there are huge incentives across wildly diverse industries to adopt autos. For many transportation companies, humans are about a third their total costs. That's just the straight salaries. Humans sleeping in their long-haul trucks cost time and money, accidents cost money, carelessness costs money. If you think insurance companies will be against it, guess what? 
their perfect driver is one who pays their small premiums and never gets into an accident. The autos are coming, and they're the first place where most people will really see the robots changing society. But there are many other places in the economy where the same thing is happening, just less visibly. So it goes with autos, so it goes for everything. It's easy to look at autos and Baxters and think technology has always gotten rid of low-skilled jobs we don't want people doing anyway. They'll get more skilled and do better educated jobs like they've always done. Even ignoring the problem of pushing a hundred million additional people through higher education, white-collar work is no safe haven either. If your job is sitting in front of a screen and typing and clicking, like maybe you're supposed to be doing right now, the bots are coming for you too, buddy. Software bots are both intangible and way faster and cheaper than physical robots. Given that white-collar workers are, from a company's perspective, both more expensive and more numerous, the incentive to automate their work is greater than low-skilled work. And that's just what automation engineers are for. These are skilled programmers whose entire job is to replace your job with a software bot. You may think even the world's smartest automation engineer could never make a bot to do your job, and you may be right, but the cutting edge of programming isn't super smart programmers writing bots, it's super smart programmers writing bots that teach themselves how to do things the programmer could never teach them to do. How that works is well beyond the scope of this video, but the bottom line is there are limited ways to show a bot a bunch of stuff to do, show the bot a bunch of correctly done stuff, and it can figure out how to do the job to be done. Even with just a goal and no knowledge of how to do it, the bots can still learn. Take the stock market, which in many ways is no longer a human endeavor. It's mostly bots that taught themselves to trade stocks, trading stocks with other bots that taught themselves. As a result, the floor of the New York Stock Exchange isn't filled with traders doing their day jobs anymore. It's largely a TV set. So bots have learned the market and bots have learned to write. If you've picked up a newspaper lately, you've probably already read a story written by a bot. There are companies that teach bots to write anything, sports stories, TPS reports, even say those quarterly reports that you write at work. Paperwork, decision making, writing, a lot of human work falls into that category, and the demand for human mental labor in these areas is on the way down. But surely the professions are still safe from bots, yes? When you think lawyer, it's easy to think of trials, but the bulk of lawyering is actually drafting legal documents, predicting the likely outcome and impact of lawsuits, and something called discovery, which is where boxes of paperwork gets dumped on the lawyers and they need to find the pattern or the one out-of-place transaction among it all. This can be bot work. Discovery, in particular, is already not a human job in many law firms. Not because there isn't paperwork to go through, there's more of it than ever, but because clever research bots shift through millions of emails and memos and accounts in hours, not weeks, crushing human researchers in terms of not just cost and time, but most importantly, accuracy. Bots don't get sleepy reading through a million emails. But that's the simple stuff. IBM has a bot named Watson. You may have seen him on TV destroy humans at Jeopardy, but that was just a fun side project for him. Watson's day job is to be the best doctor in the world, to understand what people say in their own words and give back accurate diagnoses. He's already doing that at Sloan Kettering, giving guidance on lung cancer treatments. Just as autos don't need to be perfect, they just need to make fewer mistakes than humans, the same goes for doctor bots. Human doctors are by no means perfect. The frequency and severity of misdiagnoses are terrifying, and human doctors are severely limited in dealing with a human's complicated medical history. Understanding every drug and every drug's interaction with every other drug is beyond the scope of human knowability. Especially when there are research robots whose whole job it is to test thousands of new drugs at a time. And human doctors can only improve through their own experiences. Doctor bots can learn from the experience of every doctor bot, can read the latest in medical research and keep track of everything that happens to all their patients worldwide and make correlations that would be impossible to find otherwise. Not all doctors will go away, but when the doctor bots are comparable to humans and they're only as far away as your phone, the need for general doctors will be less. So professionals, white-collar workers, and low-skill workers all have things to worry about from automation. But perhaps you are unfazed because you're a special creative snowflake. Well, guess what? You're not that special. 
Creativity may feel like magic, but it isn't. The brain is a complicated machine, perhaps the most complicated machine in the whole universe, but that hasn't stopped us from trying to simulate it. There is this notion that just as mechanical muscles allowed us to move into thinking jobs, that mechanical minds will allow us to move into creative work. But even if we assume the human mind is magically creative, it's not, but just for the sake of argument, artistic creativity isn't what the majority of jobs depend on. The number of writers and poets and directors and actors and artists who actually make a living doing their work is a tiny, tiny portion of the labor force. And given that these are professions dependent on popularity, they'll always be a very small portion of the population. There can't be such a thing as a poem and painting based economy. Oh, by the way, this music in the background that you're listening to, it was written by a bot. Her name is Emily Howell, and she can write an infinite amount of new music all day for free. And people can't tell the difference between her and human composers when put to a blind test. Talking about artificial creativity gets weird fast. What does that even mean? But nonetheless, it's a developing field. People used to think that playing chess was a uniquely creative human skill that machines could never do, right up until the point they beat the best of us. And so it will go for all human talents. Right. This may have been a lot to take in, and you might want to reject it. It's easy to be cynical of the endless and idiotic predictions of futures that never are. So that's why it's important to emphasize again that this stuff isn't science fiction. The robots are here right now. There is a terrifying amount of working automation in labs and warehouses around the world. We have been through economic revolutions before, but the robot revolution is different. Horses aren't unemployed now because they got lazy as a species, they're unemployable. There's little work that a horse can do to pay for its housing in hay. And many bright, perfectly capable humans will find themselves the new horse, unemployable through no fault of their own. But if you still think new jobs will save us, here is one final point to consider. The US Census in 1776 tracked only a few kinds of jobs. Now, there are hundreds of kinds of jobs, but the new ones are not a significant part of the labor force. Here's the list of jobs ranked by the number of people who perform them. It's a sobering list with the transportation industry at the top. Continuing downward, all of this work existed in some form a hundred years ago, and almost all of them are easy targets for automation. Only when we get to number 33 on the list is there finally something new. Don't think that every barista or white collar worker need lose their job before things are a problem. The unemployment rate during the Great Depression was 25%. The list above is 45% of the workforce. Just what we've talked about today, the stuff that already works, can push us over that number pretty soon. And given that even in our modern technological wonderland, new kinds of work aren't a significant portion of the economy, this is a big problem. This video isn't about how automation is bad, rather that automation is inevitable. It's a tool to produce abundance for little effort. We need to start thinking now about what to do when large sections of the population are unemployable through no fault of their own. What to do in a future where, for most jobs, humans need not apply. Like almost hilarious line in certain circles that, oh, am I audible? Is this working? That it's possible to, uh, it's possible to imagine the end of human civilization, but it's not possible to imagine the end of capitalism. Have you heard it, right? Yeah, I know, I know, I know. One basic critique, one very boring critique is that it's nowhere near that powerful. I say that as a AI scientist, it's very obvious to me that the person who made this video has a very glorified view of AI. But if it were, and if it somehow magically is that productive, then why is it not okay to not work? Why is the implication that the, you know, the implication is in this video that not only will there not be work, but because somehow all the wealth that this AI would produce would keep getting concentrated. But that's not like that. If you, if you, if you can challenge that, then not working is fine. I am happy not working. I am a very lazy person. I am quite happy if I am given a big, uh, I don't know, share in some AI commons in the future. I will come write a few papers once a week and give a few talks, and perhaps code five, six lines. The point is that there are multiple inevitabilities in this video and one inevitability as you have pointed out is that the economic system will not change. It will be the same system but with more automation till 
and I think that was a big critique. And your thing was that if it is so productive, why why is it bad? Why can't we why can't we have a common? And and my critique was that it's never going to be that well. Like the the scale of AI it was showing was very out of context, and it was taking these cherry picked really successful stories. It had videos of Boston Dynamics uh, robots running around. I don't know if you guys follow Boston Dynamics on YouTube. Very funny robots. But the point is, humans do much more labor than that can be that easily replaced. And I think the most important point is that any society that will build is an ultimate accumulation of policy, political, and economic decisions. It's not something that just happens. So, but otherwise, there were some points in it which were good, which is that if we don't change anything, there is a an actual fear that some of us would not be needed and to make certain that that doesn't happen we need to change the macro structure so as to account for that so as to make certain that the benefits of um, like ubiquitous machine learning translates to some kind of uh, but there was another critique which i think should have been made is that this this infinite growth this in everything would get automated can the planet support that? We have talked about that in the previous talk about extraction. And I want to like talk a little bit about that now. So, climate change. See, the thing is, uh, remember we are talking about data localization, the idea that all of our data of a sovereign territory should stay within that. The way they perceive it uh, is that they, they want to have these data centers and they will have all the data of a country within those data centers and then and then to access them foreign companies will have to pay royalty or something the question is data centers use a lot of energy and even right now the the sort of energy consumption we are seeing in data they, they leave quite a big carbon, carbon footprint and it's not just data centers there are various technological so gpus for example gpu development is a very energy like the development takes a lot of energy and this running the gpus take a lot of energy and the more sophisticated your machines are where your deep learning systems are running the more energy you are taking it's not just limited to ai uh, for example one technology blockchain one of the biggest abuses it had was crypto right and there are a lot of critic of crypto one big critic which often gets forgotten is that to do to do that mining stuff the sort of energy calculations that were required were immense like energy outputs entire towns could use and you know it was often being done in areas where regulations were not that high and etc etc so there is the constant thing of how much energy we are consuming in building this forever growth of automation economy and how that affects the climate how that affects um, pollution essentially energy does not come for free we do not have cold fusion yet and we don't have a global system of solar millers or something so like that is really important and by the way uh, complete aside going away from the materialist conception of ethics when it comes to ai but i hope you guys do know that there is no way we can control ourselves at the 1.5 degree centigrade figure which is the number we have to like manage it it will most certainly reach to and beyond so any discussion on any technology we have ethical or otherwise we need to have that figure of two degree centigrade in our heads flying around whenever we design these future economies the third thing is metals we did talk about metals in the last thing that you know computational technology requires a lot of uh, well not easily available metals and and there is an entire economy of these metals which has not been studied yet. Last to last year in NACL, somebody wrote a paper on the energy consumption of AI, but it was more of a trade paper, like what countries are dumping their energy costs on other countries to like quickly develop these uh, computational uh, infrastructure. But there is also the amount of hoarding that is happening of semiconductor metals of stuff like that. And there are there is again wto stuff etc which um, which is pertinent and which you know if you are talking about a materialist look at ethical usage of ai then you have to also look at equity of these metals the, the countries of global south they come from and how they essentially reach hands of certain countries which have monopoly on their trade 
the fourth is we have talked about trade of energy and trade of metals then is the trade of data of course there are countries in the west which claim that it's not a thing we are not trading it it's just free flow of information and then to counter that now you have the narrative from certain global south countries like china india southeast asia that no data is a uh, property and we as a country want to hold on to that property and will not let you have it and we will do data localization etc and i think i mean i would like to challenge the first one openly and critically kind of challenge the second one as well because of course data has economic implications deep econ economic implications it's not property but it is intelligence and it controls the flow of actual property but the 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 my my problem is i want policy i first of all i don't want us to abandon the policy space when it comes to trade of data so that needs to be fought because right now there is an attempt to completely subvert that and sort of negate the whole conversation like not have that conversation and i think that's a problem but i think that having localization as a solution is also a problem because okay one thing i had mentioned before that you know even if you localize and even if you say that you know all the data of certain kind of data of india would stay in india what stops a facebook or a google to from opening a gigantic data center they definitely have the resources for that in india and your local companies even from your social democratic framework you are thinking from they will not be able to compete with that they don't have the resources to build their own data center or whatever so if you just say that you know you have to localize the data and that's the regulation that that i don't think holds secondly you could theoretically have all data of a country at a local place and you could learn machine learning models on it and then just transmit the models you only need the intelligence you actually don't need to lug that data with you everywhere so there are some technological issues with localization but i think it's also more important that we remember that you know one of the biggest problems with localization is that uh, so for example privacy like data which impacts your privacy right now you could have it in some you know place where it's out of the hands of your state and you might want that to remain so the so first of all homogenizing data is is something that is a problem we need to first say what data is data of an individual what is the data which is social data and hence regulate that secondly regulation doesn't necessarily mean localization because of all the things i have just said regulation could just means particular usages are stopped and particular uses are not stopped it doesn't need to be geographically done though for certain usages i do see the merit in the geographic argument and even strangely enough while america opposes it even they have some localization measures which they are putting up with certain uh, sort of sensitive data of certain agencies irs data for example you can't store it outside america etc etc australia has started to do that so it's not as if it's a global south thing it's also at other places i think the gdpr is like the correct direction to think that first think about protection first think about what needs to be erased and only then you can think of commons and other things then more on extraction right useless jobs the fact that you have this bloated economy of uh, so now you have some very interesting jobs like there there is a whole army of people whose job is to click the up up and down button on amazon to give like false rating to stuff so that those stuff gets bought these are called click farms they do that all day similarly you can buy like likes for your twitter and can viralize yourself there are and these are not value producing jobs right they are not actually creating value of any sort so these are useless jobs but they are a consequence of the this whatever economy we are making and, and we need to start thinking very seriously about what to do about it are these real jobs and if they are not why do they occur and what are the policy tools we can use to prevent them from happening and the last one i think this point has not been raised yet of extraction I, I, we have talked about unpaid work when a lot of this data collection is concerned a lot of that unpaid work happens in the guise of you being the consumer you are on youtube you are clicking stuff you are consuming stuff right but you are also giving them the data they need to train their algorithms to show stuff to people so that they can see more stuff and of course they would of course you know sort of fine tune it so that some hate videos or racist videos would be there to viralize because that brings clicks etc it's a 
deeply convoluted thing where the line between consumer and worker has been blurred and this you see with the uber driver who is of course like the worker as in they are driving but they are also feeding data into the machine and hence producing value of another sort so that sort of stuff how do you quantify it how do you how do you make certain that these companies in these platform companies especially that there's a very huge degree of opacity in how these platform companies work how do they uh, you know how do they pay back their workers all their workers and at some point we might have to think of very uh, sort of uh, hilarious things like perhaps unionization imagine the idea that all people who watch youtube unionize because they are producing data i mean it sounds hilarious but like you might have to start thinking in really unorthodox terms you know just to like get back the policy space that this is also something which is benefiting you so this needs to benefit society in some way yes yes i have heard a bunch of youtube producers are unionizing and uh, 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 they partnered with a german trade union which is one of the biggest trade unions in germany and the person who led that unionization effort is my favorite youtube channel jork parav who makes these sling he makes sling shots like things which shoots arrows and stones very interesting channel he has made sling shots which can take on like battle tanks and stuff but uh, yeah it's a channel of a person making sling shots but he got pissed off at youtube and one day decided to unionize and i think we need to see more unionization efforts of tech workers of all sorts if we to navigate this kind of complex economy and let's talk a bit about democracy you know we have been hinting and uh, hinting at how ethics of ai is deeply connected to the society you live in well what what controls the society you live in a large part is the political structure of it and we we are at a time where the exercise of democracy is influenced by and influences various forms of capital including technology now capital has always influenced democracy right who who won the media has always affected who you vote for etc but now we are seeing a sort of velocity of media of ai backed media of ai which is trying to capture public mood etc that it 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 has become a problem we need to think about very seriously like uh, propaganda for example what is often these days called for fake news i don't like that phrase because it has certain implications that other news is not fake which i, am, I, I think is problematic because all news in a way is fake because all news has a certain lens politics and algorithmic oppression for a while and also i don't have like good answers for that from an ethical point of view because um sometimes like we, like of course we need to have a materialist framework of what is happening but sometimes it seems to me that there are Uh, there are events afoot which even these companies don't have a control of i would like to remind you of the genocide which happened in burma for example a lot of it was directed by whatsapp whatsapp messages etc the rohingya uh, genocide and you know it's easy for us to say that you know whatsapp probably wanted virality or content or whatever you know but i am a bit doubtful about that sometimes it seems to me that sometimes the very existence of a certain kind of platform sort of uh, amplifies a certain kind of discourse which is harmful for political movements and stuff and it may not necessarily be that the platform itself is even aware of that or or understands the implications of what is happening because if you look at twitter for example twitter gets a lot of flack because there are a lot of r- nazis right wingers who are like saying extreme r- hate full stuff bigoted stuff and twitter is constantly under attack right that why do you validate them why do you give them blue ticks why this why that and then twitter goes on the other oh we'll 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 block some handles and they randomly block some handles and so unfortunates get caught up in that who have you know who have not said anything wrong and then you are like okay why did you block that person and sometimes i feel that the you know one big problem i have is that this job of policing speech should not be given to platforms it should not be their responsibility because ultimately 
they operate from a capitalist perspective they want to make profit now you are asking them okay now you moderate speech right and they will moderate speech in their own way and then you will not be happy about it i think it is way better if you have like regulations of what speech is allowed and what speech is not allowed if you are going to be moving away from you know absolute free speech paradigm anyway and interestingly enough this is something even these companies have articulated so when i was in the internet governance forum we were having this huge debate with like somebody from youtube at some point like they just gave up and they were like okay tell us what to do you guys are the regulation people tell us how you would regulate because if you give us like predictable well defined regulation we would be happy but right now it's just complete chaos because every country has its different demands and like random demands okay block this account block that account and we don't know what to do and i think while i i i don't say that give the companies benefit of the doubt i think there is some small merit in this that there is a lot of overreach by states we have seen that in the indian case where requests go that you know 4000 handles ban all of them and then twitter quickly complies and then all the activists are like why did you ban those handles i think twitter finds itself in a space where it doesn't really know what to do last slide i want to have like an open discussion uh one thing the last point definitely that how do you think ai should be governed like leave aside whatever i have said it's very obvious ai needs to be governed you can't leave it as an independent entity and ai entities need to be governed to be more specific because each ai entity is unique to its context right how do you think it should be governed how do you think it should incorporate the representation of the society it's op- it operates in what are your ideas about that if if i can have some and on democratization of it as so democratization is one of the most ill used words in ai right like google would say we have democratized ai open ai whatever i'm not talking about that i'm talking about actual democratic control of ai development in society how could it happen what are the ways in which that could be done but okay i'll give you a very lame sort of a very basic sort of an idea i think for one at least in india we need dramatic public funding into higher education which incorporates ai and also sociology of ai and a combination of the social sciences and the ai stuff in like unified curricula which look into but that requires money and political will and like right now the trend is actually the opposite as as far as public funding of higher education goes that would be my very basic idea that fund fund colleges and have ai taught properly with its social impacts and everything but but some ideas please everybody who has not spoken these three gentlemen have spoken a lot uh, they are my guests so i don't want them to monopolize the conversation but other people and also the professors please uh, please i am putting you in the spot how should we democratically govern ai and have it be representative of societies it comes from i have been seeing something really interesting there is this thing called tech workers coalition in the us which is i know i know i know bangalore has a branch now you guys are like one city which is in the wrong country sometimes right? your all your politics is from there like come on we should have our own thing but okay anyway nice tech workers union is getting international and they can sing the international air now uh, so it's a very like i've been following their work for a while i'm mutuals with the person like a lot of them on twitter and i like what they are doing and i think i think that is prime that we need to get workers some sovereignty and for that to happen there needs to be collective bargaining google engineers have already shown the way by walking out and stopping some projects and i think that is the way to go ultimately companies need workers these companies can't work without the engineers right they can't work with their shareholders or whatever they can keep their shares ultimately who is making the ai so the workers especially engineers stem workers we have to unionize them i think that is a very important part of any kind of democratization of ai but in america it's still possible in india it's it's much harder i think because the union culture has been over the years over decades been eroded bit by bit that at this point if you tell some engineer that you need to have some control over your production they would think you are a silly chap like most engineers don't think like you do like they do, they don't want control they want you know they just want a steady salary and no panga so getting that culture i think among engineers getting them to understand that they 
have a moral responsibility to control what they work on and they have a societal responsibility i think that's very important and i think it's also important from a justice point of view that you know you are producing the value why is it that you don't get the value you produce why is it that it goes to some faceless people who who you don't even know by the way same thing i was in a company for 2 years after my phd and you know we had these conversations all the time that you know we create the thing but we don't control the thing it's just yeah, that is a good way of thinking first of all of course there's there, for the second part there is a you know big answer which i won't say because that would be a bit too far into the future right we still operate within the paradigms we are given but for the first one i actually have a good use case example so it's not from ai uh, but as you know the energy sector is also pretty complicated right energy companies are notoriously complicated there is this spanish company i would like all you guys to look up it's called mondragon incorporated it's a energy wealth resources sort of a company it's a complete workers cooperative 60000 workers and they vote on everything the company has five levels of hierarchy each is voted for so like the team votes for its manager every year the manager is not selected by superiors but elected by juniors and then the managers elect somebody and they elect somebody so the the salary ratio of the person at the top of that company to somebody at the bottom is not more than 5 is to 1 as you know in most energy companies the ratio could be more than 200 300 to 1 for a ceo when compared to the lowest paid skilled worker and this company has existed since the late 40s in spain has been consistently performed so it's a good case to study on how democratization can be done well while not collapsing these convoluted process so that is one example but then why do we have to go that far we have our own example right like india coffee house i keep giving this example to people it's it's completely controlled by its worker and running a coffee house chain is not as sophisticated as a tech company but still pretty sophisticated if you want to not run it to the ground and they have been running quite well and quite cheaply uh, since like since the chain started after independence i mean the amul example is overused and boring everybody uses that but i think worker control at least some worker control over these companies deeply needed i think europe also is pushing towards that now you need to have a minimum 20% or 30% worker representation on company boards in certain european countries i think that is also the correct way to go but overall i think we need to push towards more direct control of workers over the things they work on especially on technology i think that's an excellent point somebody else please you have also they have also but more people more ideas i wouldn't give you an andrew yang answer right i would try to give you a more sophisticated answer than that you ubi has been in discussion for a while among various people i think it's interesting in the way that it at least acknowledges that you know people deserve some degree of economic freedom and i respect that however the major criticism of ubi is that it does not change that thing who owns what like the, the companies are still monopolies it's just that they have spread some of the wealth to make people consume more or live happier etc i think there needs to be a balance i think we need some form of universal basic income as our economies grow and india is nowhere near that right now uh, in the future but we also need to steadily work towards direct worker interference in how companies are run and i think they are complementary in the sense because if you have some ubi like we saw in finland with their ubi experiments that how do people spend the money the the idea was that people will waste their money they would spend it on stupid things etc but no they had their children educated better and they fixed their houses etc so it ubi does create a sort of a buffer where you have more breathing space and in that breathing space i think workers will have more uh, sort of leverage to argue for more control over their work so in that sense i think ubi is a good starting point but that's not all we should be looking at it, like welfare is important but welfare can't be all there is and ubi is a sophisticated form of welfare so i'm not a welfareist in that sense that yeah 
<laughs> it should by the way because one problem was in india then they were saying they would replace and i was like yeah don't yeah that line won't run so uh okay that's a good line uh, and also there is a lot of like the debate on ubi th- there are like very well founded critiques of ubi where the fear is that you know that you would make the working class so comfortable that they would try to get power in the working spaces i don't actually agree with that i think you actually need some breathing space right now and like people are not that easily made complacent i think people only by more education will they be able to fight better for control actual control and if we can see that happening in of all places america which is like such a ideologically polarized country i think we can have it at other places as well i have one but it doesn't exist yet so we need to like lobby for that is my answer like you need to also push for right like you mentioned right right of communities where the data is coming from and protection according to that and that imagination lacks because even the imagination we have on commons that is a bit flawed and it doesn't like take into account collective well collective equity for example and i think anything which which talks about protecting data needs to have that but right now in the indian policy sphere we we have a very warped version of commons and we don't have that thing precisely so we need to sort of you know somebody once told me that if you want these things to actually end up becoming bills and laws you and your academic friends need to sit down write a mock bill and then send it to like you know these circles because that's the only way things get done these you need to sit down and write a law and like <laughs> yeah, 